Do you remember the last time somebody hurt you so much that you wanted to start avoiding them? Or the time when the person exposed you saying something personal or bad about you and everybody started laughing at you? Were you willing to forgive them despite what they did? When I was in public school, I remember I was in the cafeteria and the cafeteria was big, triple the size of this cafeteria. And it was really loud, louder than what it was last year. <laughs> and, and there was this kid and he was sitting with all his friends. See, in public school, there's cliques everywhere. And I remember I had my clique, who I referred to as my homies, you know. And we were all eating when one of them from that clique, that, that kid, came and got this yellow sticky tea and threw it all on us, like just dumped it all on us. <laughs> and everybody started laughing at us. And some of the kids who got spilled on were like, ignore them. But I lost my temper and got some of that sticky tea because we had sticky tea as well. And we threw it all, I threw it all on his head. <laughs> and it's sad because even though he wasn't even the one who threw the tea on me, I was just mad because he was making fun of me. And at that moment, my attitude was, if you want something to laugh about, I'll give you something to laugh about. The story doesn't end there, but I am not gonna, I am not gonna say the rest because that's besides the point. The reason I brought it up is because many times, instead of forgiving, we tend to just react impulsively instead of forgiving them for what they did. In my situation, simple silence could have solved everything, but I failed because forgiveness is not always easy. Sometimes we have been so hurt that forgiveness seems impossible. But thanks to Jesus Christ, each of us can be forgiven of our mistakes, sins, and wrongdoings. So as we can be forgiven of our sins, why don't we forgive others of their wrongdoings? Though it can be difficult to do, forgiving those who have hurt us frees us from the bitterness and weight of grudges and vengefulness. Someone once said, Forgiveness is one of the most beautiful and powerful concepts that we should apply in our Christian walk. And it's true, but not until we realize how many times we have fallen and accept that each time we fall, God has forgiven us, will we receive strength from him to go forgive others. And tonight, I'll be talking about forgiveness in three different aspects. First, we will see how we owe God. God's forgiveness and my main point, which is my last point, how as he forgave us, we should go forgive others. But first, let's have a word of prayer. My dear precious Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, because today you gave me the opportunity to come and give this talk. I ask that you'll be with my brothers and sisters and that you will help us to learn to forgive other people like you did. Thank you for everything, and I ask this in the name of Jesus, amen. If you open your Bibles with me to Matthew 18, 24, there is a story that we probably all know, and it says, Matthew 18, 24. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. When we look at this story, we see that God is the king and we are the servants. And we, my friends, owe God a lot. In the book, Signs of the Times, Ellen G. White says, The duty we owe to God is revealed in his word in unmistakable clearness. Do you intend to obey God? Do you intend to give heed to the scriptures? We may not owe God by money. The Lord doesn't ask us to give him riches, you know. What the Lord wants from us is to truly obey him. We belong to Jesus. He has brought us with his precious blood, and we owe him a debt of gratitude which we can never repay, but which we should daily acknowledge by willing and selfish service. If we realize this, as we should, we shall be Christ-like. 
Remember, we owe it to God to love him. And I'm not saying it's going to be easy. It can be hard to give it all to the Lord. Personally, in my life, it's hard to give him the things that I cherish sometimes because we're so unfaithful and we don't want to let go of those things that make us happy or we think they do. We know we owe God, we just don't want to listen. There is another story in the Bible where there was a man that owed God. If you open your Bibles to Judges 11, starting in verse 30, it says, And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the people of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So Jephthah advanced toward the people of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. And he defeated them from error as far as Minith, 20 cities, and to Abel Karamim with a very great slaughter. Thus the people of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. When Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and dancing, and she was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. You are among those who trouble me, for I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot go back on it. So she said to him, my father, if you have given your word to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, because the Lord has avenged you from your enemies, the people of Ammon. Every time I read this story, I would get so sad because even though he was victorious in the war, at the end he had to kill his own daughter. But what is powerful to me now is that his daughter acknowledged the fact that her father had made this promise to God, and now he owed it to him by killing her. She knew and also her father knew that he was in debt with the Lord for making him victorious in the war. And she respected the fact that when you promise something to God, you have to give him what you said. And don't look God as a bad God. God just wanted to see Jephthah's faithfulness. And just like Jephthah, God wants us to be faithful. That's why we should love him more and more every day, because he deserves it. If you look at the story of the cross, that's where he paid it all for our sins and forgave us. Let's keep reading Matthew 18, 27. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. I remember in the past reading this story and saying how this man didn't deserve the king's forgiveness, especially when you read the rest of the story. But that man is you and I. And even though we owe God, he still forgives us. There are many stories in the Bible where we see God's forgiveness. We see Mary the prostitute, the city of Nineveh, Saul the man who persecuted the Christians, Adam and Eve when they ate the fruit they were permitted to eat, David when he killed Uriah just to steal his wife, and many other stories. And God forgave them all despite what they did. And the beautiful part is that he won't even remember. If you open your Bible to Isaiah 43:25, it says, I even I am he that blotted out thy transgressions for my own sake and will not remember thy sins. This verse reminds me of a story I read a while ago where there was a pastor in the Philippines who carried the burden of a secret sin he had committed many years before. He had repented but still had no sense of God's forgiveness. In his church was a woman who had claimed to have vis visions in which she spoke with Christ and he with her. The pastor, however, was skeptical. To test her, he said, the next time you speak with Christ, I want you to ask him what sin your pastor committed in Bible college. The woman agreed. A few days later, the priest asked, well, did, you visit, well, did Christ visit you in your dreams? Yes, he did, she replied. And did you ask him what sin I committed in Bible college? Yes. Well, what did he say? He said, I don't remember. Isn't this beautiful, the fact that we naturally sin and every time we ask for forgiveness, 
he won't even remember the iniquities that we make. And every time we can sense that he forgives us, we should always look at the story of the cross. In the book, Sermons and Talk, Volume 1, it says, There was one who came to me and said, Sister White, can you tell me how am I to, how am I to know that Jesus forgives my sins as I repent of them? Yes, I can. I point you to Calvary, to the dying Savior upon the cross. There is the evidence that we present to the mind. It is the evidence that you see that Christ forgives sin. The light reflected from the cross of Calvary speaks to us of the blood of Jesus Christ, which was shed for the remission of sins, and it tells us that we may be cleansed and sanctified. If you guys go to your Bibles to Matthew twenty-seven twenty-eight, it says, And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail the king of the Jews. And they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads. Then if you skip to verse 40, it goes on saying, You who destroy the temple and built it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is what makes forgiveness beautiful. The fact that we as sinners and undeserving, he was willing to come to this world and forgive us from our sins. All that we just read is what he went through, and I bet it was more than what it describes here in the Bible. And even though they did all this to him, and even though his father forsook him, or he thought his father forsook him, should make us accept more his forgiveness to us. In the article Review and Herald, it says, in the light of divine revelation through the atoning sacrifice, we may see the glorious plan of redemption whereby our sins are pardoned and we draw near to the heart of infinite love. We see how God can retain all his justice and yet pardon the transgressor of his law. And we are not simply forgiven, but we are accepted of God through the beloved. The plan of redemption is not merely a way of escape from the penalty of transgression, but through it the sinner is forgiven his sins and will be finally received into heaven not as a forgiven culprit, pardoned and released from captivity, yet looked upon with suspicion and not admitted to friendship and trust, but welcomed as a child and taken back into fullest confidence. The sacrifice of our Savior has made ample provision for every repenting, believing soul. Shouldn't we appreciate as far as possible that God forgives sins? Just imagine not being able to be forgiven by God wouldn't that be a pain? But forgiveness has a broader meaning than many suppose. When God gives a promise that he will abundantly pardon, he, sorry, he adds as if the meaning of the promise exceeded all that we could comprehend. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55, 7 through 9. God's forgiveness is not merely a legal act by which he sets us free from condemnation. It is not only forgiveness from sin, but reclaiming from sin. It is an outflow of redeeming love that transforms the heart. They say that David had the true conception of forgiveness when he prayed, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 51, 10. Instead of just forgiving and not being mad, we should not do it again and ask the Lord to give us a clean heart like David. And this leads to my last point, forgiving others. Let's finish reading the story in Matthew. And it says, But the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. 
And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. Man, when I read this story for the first time, I was so mad. Like, they just forgave you from a big debt, and you won't forgive somebody who owes you less. In the book Christ Object Lessons, chapter 19, it says, There are many who hope by their own works to merit God's favor. They do not realize their helplessness. They do not accept the grace of God as a, as a gift, but are trying to build themselves up in self-righteousness. Their own hearts are not broken and humbled on account of sin, and they are exacting and unforgiving towards others. Their own sins against God compared with their brother's sin against them are as 10,000 talents to 100 pence, nearly 1 million to 1, yet they dare to be unforgiving. And sometimes we're like that, that servant. We tend, to forg- we tend to forgive for something little. We tend to not forgive for something little they did to us, but when we do something worse, we want them to forgive us. When was the last time you forgave somebody for something they did? Let me end with a story. The person telling it says, it was in a church in Munich where I was speaking in 1947 that I saw him, a bald-headed, heavy-set man in a gray overcoat. (coughs) One moment, I saw the overcoat and the brown hat. The next, a blue uniform and a visited cap with its skull and crossbones. Memories of the concentration camp came back with a rush. The huge room with its its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath the parchment of skin. Bessie and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi concentration camp. This man had been a guard at Raven's Rock Concentration, where we were sent. Now he was in front of me, hand thrust out. A fine message, Frawling. How good is it to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea? It was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors, and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Raven's Rock in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there. But since that time he went on, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? And I stood there and could not. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I had ever had to do. For I had to do it, I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition, that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I pray silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmness seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did that day. That friend or stranger of yours that you haven't forgiven probably didn't do something as murder a loved one or committed a terrible crime. But no matter what small thing they did, we should still go and forgive. 
Because even though it hurts inside to think about how much that supposed real friend hurt you, pause and think about how it hurt Jesus to see us in all this sin rejecting him. Yet he still went to the cross to let himself be crucified. And by that act, he forgave us. Is there someone in your mind right now that you need to forgive? As we go and pray, I invite you to ask the Lord to give you the heart and go forgive that person that you haven't forgiven. Let's pray. My dear precious Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, because um, today you gave us a beautiful day. Lord, I ask that you will help us forgive the people that do us wrong. Help us to have your heart, because we were really bad sinners, but you still came to this cross, and even though you were tortured and mocked, you still died on the cross for us. Help us, Lord, to have your spirit as we go to the person to ask for forgiveness, even for that person that comes to ask for forgiveness. Help us, Lord, today, and thank you for everything. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.